we're pleased to have Colleen Tierling from the Maine Forest Service to talk about the current threats posed by emerald ash borer and brown tail moth. Colleen is a forest entomologist and has spent 10 years largely focusing on invasive insects. Welcome, Colleen. Hi. Thanks. So, um, I apologize for the very boring title, um, but I had this talk already and then realized just before I left, I don't have a title, so, you know, invasive insects. I think, I think your title, that we had you know, invasive insects in your backyard is probably a little bit better. Um, so first of all, I'm going to be talking about invasive insects, but I want to emphasize that for most of us, um, or for most insects, the vast majority of insects out there are beneficial. We would not survive without them. Okay, and I'm going to have to wander around and point at things. So um, we've got a lot of pollinators out there. If we didn't have pollinators, we wouldn't be eating very much at all. Um, there are a lot of parasites and predators that if we didn't have parasites and predators, we would be knee deep in insects. And I think I just turned this off, didn't I? Or no? No, okay. Um, and just cool insects that are out there that are you know, a huge part of our ecosystem. So in general, insects are hugely important for us, even if we don't think about them very much. But every once in a while, an insect leaves the place where it was meant to be come somewhere else, and then it becomes a huge problem. And that's what invasive insects are. They're from someplace else, um, either from another continent, or even from, say, the west coast of our continent, from you know, west of the Rocky Mountains coming to the east. It's out of its environment, and all of a sudden, all the checks and balances that normally kept it under control are now gone, and, and that's when insects run amok. And by the way, if anybody has questions, just please interrupt me and, and uh, ask them because I'd rather have more of a back and forth conversation rather than just be up here talking. So stop me if you have any questions. So I'm going to talk about a few of the insects that are an issue right here in Portland because we've been getting more and more of them recently. So brown tail moth, you guys have probably heard about brown tail moth. <laughs> probably everybody around here has heard about brown tail moth. Um, it is uh, a caterpillar that has hairs on it, these hairs here, as well as a bunch of really tiny microscopic hairs, um, are toxic. And uh, so it does feed on trees, and it can actually kill trees, although it doesn't usually end up killing the trees, but it can. Um, it certainly can cause the trees to decline and, and die back. But the main thing is that the caterpillars have these really toxic hairs. It can cause a rash, really miserably itchy. I can attest to that personally. Um, and it can also cause respiratory distress. Um, every time the caterpillar molts, it uh, sheds its skin, and the hairs fall off, and they're down in the environment. They're blowing through the air. If you breathe them in, and if you're allergic to them, you, or if you have asthma, you can end up with pulmonary edema and people have ended up in the hospital. So it can be fairly serious. Um, so the hairs are on the caterpillar, but they're also on the cast skins. And then when the caterpillar pupates, they use all those hairs to create their cocoon cocoons. And they stay toxic for up to three years. So often what happens is come winter or fall, somebody is cleaning out their gutters and they're not even thinking about brown tail moth at that point of year because brown tail has come and gone and it's not an issue. But there could be hairs in their gutters. There could be um, cocoons underneath, the, uh, underneath their eaves or something like that. And they're cleaning them off. And all of a sudden, they've got a rash or they're having trouble breathing. And so that's something to remember is that those hairs are out there long after the caterpillars are gone. Most of the hairs get sort of incorporated into the soil, matted down under leaves and things like that. And so they're kind of out of the system. But um, in places where the hairs can, can accumulate, like in your gutters or you know, on a boat or something like that, that's, or a trailer that's parked under a tree, those hairs will stay toxic for up to three years. Um, our cold winter weather, unfortunately, does not kill brown tail moth. Um, and I really wish it did, but our winter doesn't protect us at all. There is, we have found that there is one thing that does tend to to keep them in check, and that's a cold, wet spring. 
um, but we can't do a whole lot to control our, our weather. And so this year we had a fairly, a very dry spring and brown tail moth is definitely not good this year. So a little bit of the history. So if it comes from Europe. This is a, an issue in, in England and Europe. It's generally not as bad as it can get here because again, it's a native insect there and things can tend to keep it in check. They first came to um, down here in, in Somerville in Massachusetts in the late 1800s and just spread all throughout um, New, the northern New England states and then up into Canada throughout much of New Brunswick and coastal Nova Scotia. And then it tended to retreat a little bit and we don't entirely know why. Um, and then, yeah, and then it retreated like right down to a few islands in Casco Bay and Cape Cod. That was partly because we were waging this war against brown tail moth in the, uh, in the early 1900s. And then after, after we kind of knocked it down, there were sort of periodic outbreaks over the next 60 years, but fairly small. And then in the late 1980s is when it started to come back. Um, so there were a lot, of, a lot of efforts made to try to control this insect. Um, the winter webs were, were clipped, so probably don't see it much in this picture, but all along the outside of the trees on the tips of the branches, they um, spend their, their winters in little folded up leaves. And so back in the day, apparently, they would hire school kids for a nickel, uh, a nickel a web, and they'd clamber around in trees, which I'm pretty sure we wouldn't get away with now. Um, and they would clip them out, and they'd have big bonfires. Uh, there were also spray projects initiated. Trees were cut down. There was a big federal quarantine, which has since been lifted and a big biological control program where they brought over uh, diseases and parasites to try to keep them under control. Um, and as I said, it went, the, the population went right down to a um, very, very small area just on a few islands off Casco Bay. Um, and the population stayed low for a long time and we don't entirely know why, possibly due to the weather, possibly due to this fungus here. Um, that I talked about that you know, still is out there and, and, on, and on wet, in wet springs, the, the, uh, the fungus does really do a number on, on brown tail. Um, this is sort of showing you um, the populations of brown tail moth from our survey. Um, way back in 2003, when we were very naive, we called that an outbreak. Um, and then you see where we are now. Um, 2016, we thought, oh, next year is going to be really bad because we actually saw uh, the populations rising really high in the, in the uh, fall. Um, and, but then we had a really, in 2017, we had a cool, wet spring, and the population was much lower than we expected it to be. We don't have the graph for this year, but you know, we're way, way up there this year. Um, and so the population's just been growing. And this is kind of our risk map. And Portland is actually, where's Portland? Yeah, Portland is, is in pretty good shape. Um, it's in an area that's yeah, not, not really awful, um, but there is, there is some brown tail here. Uh, and this, this map has just been growing and getting redder and redder and redder over the last few years. So in the red is where it's really bad, orange not so bad, yellow pretty low, and then the blue is areas where people need to watch, where we have just really small amounts. And I am not going to make your eyes glaze over with, with, a, uh, with a life cycle, but just very briefly I want to show you where, when and where the hairs are, are, uh, are around. So. In the spring is when the, uh, as soon as the, the leaves come out, the spring is when uh, the caterpillars start to come out and they start feeding on the leaves. And as soon as they start feeding, that's when they start molting and dropping their, their shed skins and hairs start building up in the environment. And then in, uh, am I sort of going in and out and does that matter? For I think it's small enough you can probably Okay, I don't need it for this, okay, good. All right. That makes my life easier. Um, so, so then in July, 
That's when the, the insects pupate, the caterpillars pupate. And again, as I mentioned, there's lots of hairs in the cocoons. And sometimes they'll pupate in the trees. Sometimes they will pupate on structures, like under your eaves or under your picnic tables. Then in um, late July and into August is when the, the brown tail moth itself comes out. It's a beautiful little white moth. Um, and it's got a little brown tail. And you will, if you're in an area with a lot of brown tail moths, you'll often see them coming to your lights at night. And they lay their eggs in, in August. And the eggs hatch in August, September. But the, at that point in time, the caterpillars are so tiny that either their, their hairs are too small to actually have an effect on people, or the toxin might not even be in the hairs, and the research is still kind of up in the air about which is the case. But anyway, in the fall, you don't really need to worry about these, these caterpillars. They're really tiny. But they do hatch in the fall, and they do a little bit of feeding um, out on the, sort of the, the leaves on the outer edges of the trees. And then in the winter, that's when they... Um, they fold together leaves, and they silk, silk a leaf together. And inside that leaf will be about 200 to up to 500 caterpillars or so. And they spend the winter inside that leaf. And so it's probably a good idea to familiarize yourself with that. If you see in the winter on an oak tree or an apple tree, I didn't mention that, did I? Their, their main hosts are oak, oak and apple. Um, and so if you see an oak tree or apple tree that the um, all around the outside of the tree, you, it looks like there are just leaves still stuck to the tree in the winter. That's probably um, brown tail moth. And inside any one of those leaves if, um, would be those, the, cater the tiny little caterpillars just waiting for spring. Um, if you look on a sunny day, you can often see that the, the leaf is attached to the, tw to the twig with a little bit of white silk, and you'll have to see that shining in the light. Um, and I so in the winter at control, the best way to control these insects when, if you can, is in the winter on low trees, like, like apple trees, crab apple trees, small oak trees. You can cut the winter webs right out just with a pair of pruners. If you've got you know, a slightly small, taller tree, I've been telling people just rent a pair of pole pruners because you can clip out all of those, those, uh, those winter webs or hire somebody to do it for you and dunk them in a bucket of soapy water, and you can make the problem go away entirely. That is absolutely the best way to control winter moth on a small tree. Um, if you have a great big oak tree that has thousands of, of webs in it, or hundreds of webs in it, um, and you can't get up there, obviously, then the only way to really control them is with chemical control. So there are pesticides that can be used. Um, it needs to be done early in the spring, though. By the time people start itching, and started seeing that their, their trees are really defoliated, at that point in time, it's too late to really do anything. Um, because even if you kill the caterpillars, the hairs are already out there. And killing a few caterpillars, even if you kill you know, a few thousand caterpillars in one little area, in the greater scheme of things, that's not going to really make a difference for the following year. So you really want to treat, if you're going to treat chemically, treat early on in the season. And just as sort of a word of caution if you wait till the if you do decide that you have trees that you need to to chemically control um, winter moth or brown tail moth you want to um, do that you want to call your find an arborist and call them early on uh, because by spring these guys are so booked up and they're working flat out and they often they get to just a tiny fraction of the calls because when people start panicking and calling them up there's just not enough people to do the work so Call in the winter and make an appointment if you decide you want to do that. Um, and of course, the control is better if it's widespread. And you know, if there's chemical control, if you decide you want to do chemical control, sometimes a whole neighborhood will get together and say, "We're going to treat these big, big oak trees." Um, and it gets cheaper for everybody to do it that way. And then also, you kind of clear the neighborhood of brown tail moth. Um, and that has happened in some of the towns where brown tail has been really bad for for a number of years. Um, so let me just, I've got a picture here of what, what the little winter webs look like. And as you see, it just, this is an apple tree, or crab apple tree, I guess. It just looks like there are little leaves stuck to, stuck to the outside edge of the tree. When you look closely and you see here um, in the sunshine, you can see there that it's covered in silk, and the silk is attaching the, the, uh, that little web to the tree. 
So getting a, a search image for that is, is really good. And definitely for all of these insects that I'm talking about, if you want more information about them, you can go to our website. If, or if you just even Google Maine Forest Service and brown tail moth, it would take you to our website. And there's information there. And this, I'm not going to say too much about this, but I've got a copy of this in the uh, back on the table there. This is just some of the hairy caterpillars that we have here in Maine. Um, brown tail moth. Definitely you want to keep, you know, be very wary of it and keep an eye on it. It's easy to tell because you've got those two orange dots on the tail end of it. So it's invasive. Gypsy moth is closely related to brown tail moth. Has hairs that can be irritating to people who are sensitive to it, but not nearly to the extent of, of the brown tail moth. It's also invasive. Um, I know in Portland I had a call this spring from a woman who had gypsy moth uh, egg bass on her house. They were crawling on her house. And they gave her an asthma attack because she had asthma. And, and so it is something that you need to be a little bit careful about. And then these two, eastern tent caterpillar is the one that, that creates all those webs in the forks of trees. You see these big white silk um, webs in the trees. Um, and then forest tent caterpillar, another native insect. I don't know if you heard the news of brown tail, but they were all over the roads there. They actually had to close roads because caterpillar guts were making the roads so um, so slippery that there was causing accidents. <laughs> so um, in general, hairy caterpillars, especially brightly colored hairy caterpillars, it's probably good not to touch them. They're hairy and brightly colored for a reason. And it's basically to say, you know, stay away from me. Don't mess with me. I'm toxic. Um, most of them, luckily, are not nearly as toxic as brown tail moth. But they, I tend to not pet furry caterpillars. So that's brown tail moth. Any questions? Yeah. Are they really dangerous to birds and like small rodents? They, I, I think birds don't tend to eat them. We haven't seen a whole lot of birds eating them. I don't know how dangerous they are, but I do know that, that pets will get the rash. Um, I know my cat has gotten it when, anytime he's outside, and I've gotten to the point, and he actually carries the hairs inside. So every time my cat comes in, I meet him at the door with a wet washcloth, and I just wipe him down entirely. Because they, he, it was on his face, and, and where his fur was thin around his ears, and, and he was scratching himself bloody. Um, so yeah, definitely pets can get it. Probably, I'm guessing it probably does affect things like mice and rodents and squirrels and things like that. Um, not much we can do for them. <laughs> So winter moth, another insect that has not been around for all that long in Maine. Um, we found it probably about five or six years ago. And another invasive species, again, from Europe. And uh, it's another moth, but this time it's one of the naked moths. So you don't need to worry about hairs. It's an inchworm. We've got a lot of native inchworms, so don't worry that every inchworm you see is, is a winter moth. But uh, this one definitely is. Uh, so this, unlike um, brown tail moth, which has a fairly narrow host range, you know, largely on oaks and, and apples, winter moth has a really wide host range. So a lot of the hardwood trees, the leafy trees. Oaks, again, and apple are two of their favorite ones. And, um, and so a lot of our trees in this area are getting hammered by both, both uh, uh, winter moth and brown tail moth. But then there's also a wide, other, wide range of, of other, um, other host trees, maple trees, birch trees, basswood, or chilia trees, linden trees, um, blueberry. So it actually is an agricultural pest as well as, as a pest in the forest and a pest of, <clears throat> of landscape trees. The, tree, the insect feeds really early in the season. And so it, it feeds even before the leaves open up, so when they're still in the bud. And so you get this kind of Swiss cheese effect as it just mines through the bud, creating holes. Kind of like when you fold up paper and cut out a paper snowflake. That sort of is what's happening with the insect feeding. Then later on, um, it tends to just feed and, and completely chew up the, the whole leaf. Winter moth is, oh, you, if you want to send around winter moth. Oh, and you can send around brown tail too. If, I think there's the top two there. 
Uh, here. That's winter moth, yeah. And that's brown tail if you want to take a look at it. So winter moth is a really, really nondescript little beige moth. And we wouldn't expect anybody to identify it just by looking at it. In fact, we can't even identify it by looking at it. We have to actually collect the males and dissect their genitalia in order to tell what species it is. And so you have to do it under a microscope. Um, but the way you can identify them is through their name. They're called winter moth, and they actually fly. The adults fly in November to January. So sometime around um, Thanksgiving is when we often see them. And so from Thanksgiving right to January, the, the males will fly. The females actually don't even have um, wings. They've got very vestigial little bits of wings. So they don't fly. So in the, uh, in the fall, in the winter, you know, in November, December, they crawl out of the ground where they've been pupating, crawl up the tree. They have pheromones that call all the guys to, or, to them. And the males will come in and mate with them on the tree. And then the females keep crawling up the tree, up to the top, and, and lay their eggs on the twigs and the branches. Then early, early in the spring, the caterpillars, the eggs hatch into tiny little caterpillars before the, the uh, buds even hatch, on the, or sorry, before the buds even open on the trees. And you can see a tiny little caterpillar there circled in blue. Um, and that's when they cause this kind of feeding. They continue to feed into May and early June. And then they drop down to the ground and they pupate. And they pupate in the soil, and they're in there from June right to, through to November looking exactly like a piece of dirt. They use dirt to, to cover their uh, cocoon. Um, and remember that, that they're there from June to November, looking exactly like dirt. Um, how they got here were, they, we know that they, from genetic studies, we know that they came from Massachusetts. These insects were, are, are in Massachusetts. They have been a big issue in um, Nova Scotia as well. But the genetics say that ours came from, from Massachusetts. How, they, how do they get here when the females can't fly? Well, looking at the patterns of, of where they are, they're not in the forests. They're not right along the shore. Where we first found them was around the second homes of people who lived in Massachusetts. So we figured probably what happens is, you know, you live in Massachusetts, you divide up your hostas, you say, oh, I'll plant some up in my summer home up, in, up on the coast. And that's what happened. They, dug up their hostas with all those cocoons in them looking just like dirt, and they had no idea what they were doing and brought it up here, and all around the second homes is where we found, found winter moth. So that's what happens. And uh, so we have them now basically all along the coast, up as far as Bar Harbor we've been, we've been finding them. Um, a few real hot spots in Portland, South Portland, um, has been you know, one, of the, one of the early spots where we found it. And, and they are killing the trees in Cape Elizabeth. There, if you drive along some of the roads, I can't remember which road now, but you can see big oak trees that are dead. And they've been killed by winter moth um, because the trees just get heavily defoliated. And then maybe gypsy moth comes along and defoliates them as well, or brown tail moth defoliates them as well. And if it happens year after year, a tree can take defoliation for a year or two, um, even complete defoliation for a couple of years. But if it happens multiple years, or if it gets defoliated twice in one year, that's it, the trees end up dying. And so we're seeing, we're seeing mortality um, in some of those red, red areas. So how do you control it? Practice safe soil. <laughs> Um, don't move materials around from, from places that are infested. And we've, had, we've actually had people be really responsible about this. There have been some libraries in some of the small towns that use plant sales as fundraisers, and they voluntarily decided we're not going to do a plant sale because we know we've got a lot of, brown, of winter moth, and we don't want to set it out to other areas. Other places do have their plant sales, but they will tell people, you know, these plants are infested with winter moth. Don't take them out of this area. If you live in a winter moth infested area, sure, it's safe to buy them because you've already got winter moth. But if you live inland somewhere, don't buy these plants because you'll be bringing winter moth 
to, to your home and end up killing your trees. Um, so that's, that's probably one of the most important things to do is just don't move plants from underneath infested trees. If you're out in a, if, you, if you've got plants that are out in the middle of a field where you're not likely to have, you know, where, where you're not likely to have pupa in it because there's no trees nearby, those would be a little safer to move around. But anything that's underneath trees that are infested by, by hemlock woolly adelgid, you're pretty much guaranteed that any time that the frost is out of the soil and you're capable of moving winter moth, that's, or when you're capable of moving your plants, you will also be guaranteed to pretty much move your winter moth. Um, so other ways of control, remember I told you that the female doesn't have wings and so she climbs up so when she, in the fall when she comes out from under the, uh, from, from the soil, she climbs up the tree and calls to the males and the males come and mate with her. So if you can put sticky bands around the tree, um, she gets caught on these sticky bands and the males fly in and they get caught on that as well. And that can be effective. However, you need to put bands around all of the trees in an area um, because you guys have probably seen tiny little caterpillars that silk down on a silk thread and then blow in the wind. Um, that's how the caterpillars of winter moth move around as well. So if you, know, you banded this tree, but this tree over here wasn't banded and, and if this was also a, a maple tree, or an oak tree, um, the caterpillars from that tree would just sort of swing over, kind of like Tarzan, and, and infest this tree as well. But that, that banding can, can work. Um, horticultural oil can also work. It basically smothers the, um, the, the insects, the, the eggs, and kills those eggs. And if you can get good, good coverage of, of your trees, that can be fairly effective. And then other than that, there's you know, general you know, conventional insecticides. Bt is actually a bacterial insecticide that's considered, um, it's organic, it only affects uh, caterpillars and, and can be used by, on, for, by organic growers. And that, that can be used, but you have to time it really carefully. It's also good for you know, ecologically sensitive areas or if you just don't want to be exposed to pesticides because it has pretty much no mammalian toxicity at all. Other than that, there are more general. Um, spinosad is a bacterial insecticide, and then just the standard chemical insecticides used for, for caterpillars can be used. What we're really sort of putting all our money on, though, is winter moth biological control. I think I told you that uh, winter moth, back in the 50s, had been an issue in Nova Scotia. They brought in this parasite, Cyzenus albicans, which is a little fly that looks kind of like a spiky, a spiky uh, uh, housefly, housefly with kind of a spiky hairdo. And it um, is a parasite. It lays its eggs on the leaves. And when the winter moth comes through and eats the leaves, it ingests the, the, um, the egg, which then hatches inside the caterpillar and eats the caterpillar from the inside out. And you know, we entomologists think this is a wonderful thing, but we're sort of a perverse lot anyway sometimes. Um, so that is something that worked really well in Nova Scotia. And, and it's very specific. It only attacks uh, winter moth. And then when the winter moth populations just crash because you know, they've all been attacked by the parasite, then the parasite numbers crash as well. And what they've just seen in Nova Scotia is that every once in a while, if the winter moth starts to rear its head again a little bit, then a year or so later, the, the parasite does and knocks it right back down again. So it's the perfect, uh, the perfect biological control. It kind of just disappears along with the winter moth, doesn't go on to anything else. Um, they've been releasing uh, this Cyzenus parasite down in, in Massachusetts as well, where they've had a big, big problem with winter, or with winter moth for a number of years, a few decades, a couple of decades. And, um, they're at the point now that their winter moth is starting to, starting to reduce the numbers as well. And so we have just started just a few years ago releasing these, these parasites. We're working with a researcher from the University of Massachusetts and getting parasites from, from them and releasing them all up and down the coast in areas where the winter moth is the worst. It should work for us. Um, 
the evidence shows that it works for other places. And actually, it works remarkably fast for forest entomology, because usually biological control, control programs may take 50 to 100 years to actually build up you know, enough numbers to, to create control, uh, because there's you know, millions of, of these insect pests out there, these moths out there, and we're releasing these parasites by the hundreds or the thousands, so it takes a while for them to build up. But uh, Massachusetts has been seeing, seeing good results within about 10 years or so. So we're hopeful that within 10 years, winter moth might not be that big of an issue. This is one of the few invasive insects that has a potentially happy ending to it. Um, and so if we can just avoid spreading winter moth further throughout Maine, you know, practice safe soil, don't move around your, your plants, um, we may have a good answer for, for winter moth. And this is just sort of a little timeline that shows that uh, winter moth is on the host plants. The eggs are on the host plants from the winter right through to the spring. And then come spring, the, the larvae are on the host plants. So you can't really move host plants around at any time of year. Um, because when they're not on the plant, they're down in the ground. And so it's really not safe to move host plants or, or soil around. <laughs> What if you were like uh, washing the roots before you transplanted it? You would need to wash them you know, completely clean, so completely bare root. Uh, because if there's just a little bit of soil, you know, these, these uh, cocoons are you know, really little and covered in dirt. So um, you could do it, and, and there have been some, some nurseries that do do that, um, if it's a plant that will accept that. And that's winter moth. Any other questions about winter moth? Hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, so that is another insect that is here. And do you want to send around the hemlock woolly adelgid one? It's the, the green, the hemlock. Yeah. So it is a little creature that's been here for quite a while. It's related to you know, the aphids that you see on your roses or anything else. Um, and in the, uh, when, you, when you see it, it's on the undersides of the twigs of, of the hemlock trees. And it's only on hemlock. We've got a lot of other woolly aphids and woolly adelgids that are on other kinds of trees. Some of them are invasive. Some of them are not. We've got a lot of, of native ones as well. But you know, if it's on hemlock, then it's probably hemlock woolly adelgid, looking like just sort of little puffy bits of cotton, cotton wool. And as I said, on the undersides of the leaves, this is where we have found it. Um, this is an insect that moves around on trees a lot. So before we had a quarantine, originally we thought, well, you know, if we put a quarantine, we don't want to totally disrupt the nursery industry. So we'll, we'll you know, have, have people look very carefully at their nursery trees that they're selling. And you know, if, if we can say, OK, yes, this is clean, then it'd be safe to sell. Well, we found, we found planted hemlock trees all the way up the coast to Machias and, and way inland, where um, people brought in trees perfectly legally. They thought they were clean. 10 years later, we find that it's just they're covered in, in hemlock woolly adelgid. So that's when we then put a quarantine in to, to absolutely stop um, hemlock trees coming in from, from infested areas. So this is where we have hemlock woolly adelgid established in the forest. As I said, we found it on planted trees in various areas in the state. But those trees, we usually hammer them pretty heavily with pesticides, or we cut down those trees entirely so that we don't start new infestations all over the state. Because um, this is an insect that we can't eradicate, but we're trying to slow down the spread. Um, and so it started down in Kittery, and it just sort of moved up the coast. Um, we found this big infestation on Fry Island there a couple of years ago. It's been there for a while, and nobody really noticed it. And we never go out to Fry Island, so we didn't notice it and until the trees actually started to die. This is an insect that will kill trees much more slowly than, say, winter moth might. Um, it usually takes a good 10 years or so, depending on the climate. This is an insect that actually is somewhat controlled by winter. So in areas further north in Maine, you know, up, up in this area, it certainly is not going to be a problem now. In the future, 
who knows you know, exactly how the climate is going to change, but um, at this point in time, we expect it to be sort of an issue in, within 100 miles or so of, of the coastal area is where um, the adelgid can, can survive well. So how do we move this insect around? Well, as I said, we moved it in on, um, on nursery tr trees. So this, the adelgid, most of its life, it spends actually attached right to the tree. And it sticks its mouth parts into the, into the twig at the base of the needle and has to stay there. Um, it's got really long mouth parts that are about twice the length of its body. And, and it can't withdraw the mouth parts from, from, the, uh, from the twig. But the very youngest of its, um, let me just go forward and now come back. So the very youngest of its, um, of the, of once, once the eggs hatch, the very youngest larvae are mobile. And they can crawl around. They have to go look for their own needle to attach to. So they can wander around quite a bit. And you know, remember those tiny little bits of fuzz that I saw or that you saw on, on the, uh, the, yeah, the Riker Mount there? Under each of those, you know, this whole thing is one of those tiny bits of fuzz. And there's a tiny little um, larval or nymph, nymphal um, adelgid. And this is a beet sheet that we put underneath a, a, an infested hemlock tree. And we just beat the, uh, beat the branch with a, with a stick. And it doesn't really look like there's a whole lot on there other than bits of twigs and stuff. But if you look more closely, all these tiny little bits here are crawlers. So there's thousands of them. And they get moved around really, really easily. If people, if people hire a, a landscaper or an arborist to work on their trees, if this arborist had worked on infested trees earlier that day or even earlier that week, his clothing would be covered, his hat would be covered, his equipment would be covered with crawlers. Um, we find that you know, animals move crawlers around, people move crawlers around, trees that are, that are hanging over, um, over driveways. If you have somebody come visit you from an infested area and they brush up against your hemlock tree during the, during the season that, that the crawlers are around, um, then, then they will almost certainly transmit um, adelgia to your tree. So all year round, live plants can carry um, hemlock woolly adelgid into new areas if, if plants are being transported. But March to July is when the eggs and the crawlers are, uh, are around. And that's the time when it's just so very easy, easy to move, um, move adelgid. So if you're going to have work done on your hemlock trees, it's probably a good thing to try to do it in the fall or the winter because then you're, you don't need to worry about um, you don't need to worry about the crawlers. Um, so natural spread, these things move around in the wind. Again, March to July, when those crawlers are around, they move around in the wind. They move around um, on animals. They move around on birds. And so I often suggest to people who have hemlock trees, if you want to try to protect your hemlock tree, think about maybe not feeding during the March to July period. Or if you want to, do want to feed your, the birds, make sure your bird feeder is as far away as possible from your hemlock tree. Because you think how birds feed, they'll fly into a feeder and then fly back to a tree, um, the nearest tree. And if that nearest tree is a hemlock tree, they'll, they'll, they can end up uh, transmitting hemlock woolly adelgid. Often when, when I get a call, somebody says, I think I have adelgid on one of my trees. And if I go to their house, I look around and see where is their bird feeder? Yep, that's the hemlock tree. And always the hemlock tree that's closest to the bird feeder is always the one that's infested. So just keep in mind that March to July is, is when they can easily be moved. And because all adelgids are females, we only have females here in North America, they don't need to mate. So all it takes is one adelgid to get moved onto a new tree and you can have a new infestation. There are two generations a year. Each, time, each generation can lay up to you know, about 300 or so eggs. So 300 times 300, that's something like 90,000. You can go from one crawler that got transmitted to a tree to having 90,000 at the end of the season. Um, so this, this insect can just kind of grow explosively. That's the potential to do that. <clears throat> so I mentioned things like, oh, 
that, that if you can prune your trees back so that you don't have, um, don't have vehicles brushing up against your trees, that's a, a good thing to do. Uh, this here, all these here, this is from Fry Island. These are all hemlock trees over here, down at the other end. These trees are looking pretty healthy. I had to look really hard, and I just occasionally found one adelgid here and there. But this, on this side right here, is a hemlock tree that was overhanging this little laneway and brushing up against every vehicle that went in. That tree was practically dead because it picked up adelgid from every vehicle that went in and out. Um, so that's definitely something that, that people can do to protect their trees, is just prune them back so that you don't have cars brushing up against them, vehicles, trailers. Even prune them so you don't have, you know, parks have been doing this, um, Ferry Beach State Park has done this, that they prune their hemlock trees so that hikers don't brush up against the trees. Because a hiker can carry indulgent crawlers from one tree to the next to the next, or they can walk through an infested park and then carry those adelgid crawlers back to their own trees. And then if they brush up against their own tree, they've just transmitted adelgid. So pruning is probably one of the, one of the th most proactive things that you could probably do. Biological control, we have been doing biological control as well for, um, for adelgid. There are no parasites for adelgid, which we usually prefer. Parasites make the best biological control. Parasites are diseases. Hemlock woolly adelgid, for some reason, has no parasites at all. So we have been using uh, predators. There are a couple of little predators we've been releasing. One is a tiny, tiny little black lady beetle, maybe a millimeter long, eight sixteenths of an inch. Um, and the other one is a slightly larger beetle. They're both specific. And so they don't attack other things. They can't, uh, they can't complete their life cycle on, on other insects. They may occasionally snack on another insect, but, but they're reliant on hemlock woolly adelgid. However, it's really expensive to buy these insects, and they're in pretty short supply. So we release them by you know, the hundreds here and there. And there are probably billions of, of adelgid out there. So, this is definitely going to be one of those long, long-term biocontrol options. We don't, you know, we don't know when it's going to work. We don't know how well it's going to work. The, the results from further south, where Delgid has been around a lot longer, suggest that, that these predators do actually help keep trees alive. Um, but it will probably be decades before we start to see real results up here. Um, Hemlock woolly adelgid can kill trees in about 10 years or so if it's a heavy infestation. So, you know, certainly there are trees that are probably going to die unless they're protected uh, with pesticides uh, because it's just going to take a long time for biocontrol to take, take effect. So things that people can do if you've got hemlock trees, as I mentioned, um, trimming your trees um, is, is a useful thing to do. All these branches here that brushed up against hikers, the park trimmed those back, and, and it, it does make a difference. If you have a tree in your yard that you can actually get coverage uh, with a po hose, a, a jet of water can actually knock a lot of those crawlers down, and they're so tiny that by the time they crawl back to the tree and crawl up, a lot of them will die. So that can sometimes help a little bit as well. Um, cutting off you know, heavily infested branches is a good thing you, to do as well. Um, during the, if you do do any trimming, you want to do that during the, um, during the, the fall, winter, so that you don't end up moving, moving adelgid around. Yeah. I was just going to ask, when you cut those branches off, how should you dispose of them? Should you burn them or soak them? Probably the best thing to do is, um, during the, during the, if you, if you trim your branches during the fall and winter, so after, after August and before March, you can do pretty much anything to them then because any adelgid on those branches are actually attached to the branches. You cut the branches off, those will die. Um, so then you could, you could send them off to your transfer station or something like that, or send them off to be recycled or composted or whatever. If you're cutting your branches in the spring and the summer when the crawlers are around, the best thing to do is just let them lie there under the tree. Very few of the crawlers are actually going to be able to make it back up the tree 
and you just you really don't want to start you don't want to throw them on the back of a trailer and drive down the road with them because you'll just be releasing clouds of crawlers into the air into all of your neighbors trees um, so the best thing is just to let them lie on the ground and you know after maybe a month or so you could then potentially take them and you know, drive them to the dump or something like that I mean you could you could potentially put them in soapy water but you know usually it's big branches and that's a lot and you could potentially burn them too but in the spring and summer you don't want to be getting a burn permit you probably couldn't get a burn permit in some places anyway so and then of course there are also chemical options for people who have you know big beautiful hemlock trees and they really want to save you know an individual tree because it's important to them chemical options is probably about the only thing that that really really will work with with good good consistency and reliability um, you can use horticultural oil um, or soap it needs to be done usually once a year or so and then there are also systemic insecticides that can be injected right into the tree or just sprayed like this just sprayed right onto the trunk of the tree and um, they will stay in that tree and they will protect the tree for yeah anywhere between five and sometimes ten years so that is something that can be done if you if you're, if you're desperate to protect your your beloved tree and the other thing I mentioned this earlier um, we do have a quarantine for um, hemlock woolly adelgid and a quarantine basically means this is an area that we consider to be generally infested you're not allowed to take stuff out of this area so for the hemlock woolly adelgid quarantine that's the area in gray and um, so what the quarantine covers is live trees so no no hemlock seedlings or nursery stock is allowed to move from the gray area out into the white area the rest of the state uh, and then it also covers branches and twigs anything that has green on it so if somebody's doing logging down in that gray area and if they cut all the foliage off of the tree and just have the logs those can actually go out of the out of the quarantine area but nothing with fo with foliage can go out of the quarantine area because that's that's the thing that's going to be carrying the crawlers um, and so but the, but anything from outside of that quarantine area can can move into the quarantine area so you could take a hemlock from Bangor and you could bring it into uh, bring it into Portland so any questions about Adelgid? Okay, one last insect, and this is not something, luckily, that Portland has yet. And may, I'm hoping it will be a long time before Portland gets, gets um, emerald ash borer. But we did find, I did find, emerald ash borer for the first time in Maine, um, just this a month ago, pretty much exactly. Um, emerald ash borer is, do you want to send around the emerald ash borer display? It's a really tiny insect. Here it is sitting on a penny. People often see pictures like that one over there of the emerald ash borer, and it's a nice, clear, beautiful picture, and they think, oh, it must be a big insect, and it's not. It's really small. Bright, brilliant metallic green. Um, on, that, on that mount there, you'll see down on the bottom, I think, a little beetle called the tiger beetle. When it's alive, it's also brilliant metallic green, and we get hundreds of calls every year. People saying, I, I saw that emerald ash borer. So far, it's always been um, the, the tiger beetle. But uh, that's, so that's, that tiger beetle is just sort of there for your reference. It's a native insect. It's a really good little predator. It's actually one of the good guys. So this is where emerald ash borer is as of now. Well, actually, no, as of last September. So it's, it's in a lot of states. It's out as far as Colorado, as far west, down as far as oh, Louisiana and Georgia and Mississippi, I think. Um, they found it this spring in Vermont. So Vermont, the entire uh, state of Vermont is now quarantined. And then we just found it way up north in, well, I'll show you us. So yeah, they found it in Vermont. So the entire state there is quarantined. The lower half of New Hampshire has it, all that big red area. Um, and, and we just found it right up there in Madawaska and Edmonston on the, on the New Brunswick side. We actually found our infestation up there 
really early because they found it in, in Edmiston and they invited me to go up and take a look, you know, and see what they were doing and help with their survey for a day or so. And I stood in their sort of ground zero area where, where the trees were heavily infested. I looked right across the river and thought, that's an ash, that's an ash, that's an ash. All these are ash in Maine. And I, I knew we had it. So I came across the river that night and went out with a draw knife and, and peeled the bark off the trees. And yeah, we, we have it up there. So it's fairly early on in the infestation. The trees are still really looking healthy, which is good because it gives us a little bit more time to do, you know, to, to manage it a little bit. Um, but actually, realistically, for you guys here in Portland, the find up in Edmonds, or in, in Madawaska, makes very little difference to your level of risk because Portland down here is an awful lot closer to the infestation in New Hampshire. And uh, the town of Lebanon is right within a 10 mile expansion buffer zone there. And um, we expect to find it down right there in that, that corner of York County any time now. Um, and so probably for people along the coast here, it will probably come up from New Hampshire before it's gonna come down from, from Edmundston, or from, from Madawaska. We do a lot of monitoring for emerald ash borer. You probably have seen over the past years those great big purple traps. They look like big box kites, they're about this big. Um, they're covered in a sticky glue and they've got a lure inside of them that smells kind of like an ash tree. It's not a great trap, but it's kind of the best that we have and it's something that's relatively cheap and we can put out by the thousands. And so we do put out a lot. Uh, Something that is actually much better is to create a trap tree. And so I've been, I work a lot with woodlot owners and volunteers and state parks and national parks and Acadia National Park and a lot of different places where we will girdle an ash tree in the spring. And that tree stays alive all summer, but it's stressed. And so it's releasing all these stress volatiles, these stress scents into the air. And if there is an emerald ash borer nearby that tree, instead of just going to a random ash tree, it'll come to that particular ash tree. Then in the fall or the winter, we cut down the ash tree and we peel the bark off of it. It's really laborious and it, we do have to sacrifice the tree, but we look then for, for the little galleries under the bark. Um, because emerald ash borer does, does burrow underneath the bark and essentially kills the ash tree from the inside. So that is something we have a lot of people doing. Um, the other thing that we do, which is kind of cool, it's kind of a homegrown um, method of, of looking for emerald ash borer is biosurveillance, which we developed here in Maine. Um, and that uses a little native wasp. It looks kind of like a yellow jacket, but it doesn't sting, it can't sting. Um, and it goes out and the females go out and they hunt um, boo-prested moths. They hunt our native boo-prested boo beetles. They hunt our native boot prestids that are related to emerald ash borer. And when emerald ash borer does come in an area, these little wasps are really good at um, catching emerald ash borer as well. And so what we do is we go out to schools is where we mainly find this. We find this in school ball fields. Um, and during the summer months, we go out and we find nests of these little wasps in the grounds, in the ball fields, ball diamonds. And watch them come in and when they're carrying something, we'll net them and we'll steal away their prey, um, just a small, small proportion of their prey, and um, look to see what species it is. And then we let the female go and she kind of shakes her head and says, what happened there? And flies off and catches another blue crested. And so because human beings are really bad at finding emerald ash borer, we're um, getting the wasps to do our hunting for us. And, uh, and that has worked actually really well in some of the other states. Um, and we only have this wasp in the sort of the lower, the southern and, and western part of the state um, because we're at the very northern edge of its range. But in, in states to the south of us, it's done a fairly good job of being the first one to detect emerald ash borer. Our other ally, oh, and then there's also just people being educated, knowing what to look for. Um, which is really, really important because we only have, oh, right now we're down to two entomologists, two forest entomologists in the state. And the chance of us actually going out and seeing emerald ash borer in the forest is pretty slim. So um, 
having a bunch of other people out sort of keeping their eyes open is really good for, it, for us. The other ally that we have are woodpeckers. Uh, woodpeckers like to feed on emerald ash borer underneath the uh, bark. And so in the winter, they're a really good food source because they're nice and fat and juicy and lots of protein in there. And woodpeckers will feed, and as they're feeding, you know, digging down into the, uh, into the bark to, to get the, pull the larva out, they'll flick off this outer bark. And um, you get, instead of this, nice, this sort of deep grayish brown color, you see this bright blonde color. And if you see that on ash trees, that means the woodpeckers have been feeding on something in that ash, and that something might be emerald ash borer. And so that's how a lot of other places have made their first, um, first identification of emerald ash borer, is watching where the woodpeckers have fed, especially in the winter when the leaves are off, it's easy to see, and the woodpeckers are hungry in the winter, and that's good food source. So that's something, something to sort of keep your eyes open for. And that is the end of my talk. <laughs> If anybody has any other questions, I'd be glad to uh, answer anything. Um, a few of the, the pesticides or the, or the treatments you talked about were uh, in oil. Yes. What, what is that exactly? It's horticultural oil. So if you were to go to a garden center, it's, it's basically just a mineral oil. So it's, it's not really toxic to, to humans. Um, and and it's, you know, it's used in organic farming all the time. And basically what it does is it coats that coats the tree, the eggs, things that are overwintering on the tree, you, you apply it usually in the late winter, or early spring. Um, it sometimes is called, um, I guess horticultural oil is usually what it's called, or dorm sometimes I think it's been called dormant oil. Um, is, is neem oil like a useful kind of industry? Actually, yes. Neem has been used. Um, I think it's been used against emerald ash borer. Um, and I think, and in the US, the US tends to have not quite as strong, or stringent. The rules are different in the US than they are in Canada for pesticides. And so Canada does not have a lot of pesticides that the US does. And so it uses neem a lot more. Um, and so they've been using that for adelgid and against uh, emerald ash borer, I believe. So, Yes, neem is certainly something that can be used. It's not used that much in the states because people tend to use the harder pesticides, the, the you know the little more the more conventional chemical pesticides. But yeah, it can be. It can often be used. One more question. Um, just thinking about you know, these insects certainly do not care about geographical borders. Uh, so um, how do you, as entomologists, communicate or network around these invasive species? Really well. Maine, Maine actually shares a whole lot more border with Canada than it does with other New England states. And so as entomologists, we have, we have working groups that, you know, the Northeast Forest Pest Council, which is all of New England and all of the Canadian Maritimes, and Lat uh, all of Atlantic Canada and Quebec. And we get together once a year, sort of in one central area, and share information. We talk to each other an awful lot. Um, and so when, when New Brunswick found emerald ash borer right on our border, the moment that they had it identified and were able to talk about it, they called us and the very next day I was on my way up there to go over and see their infestation. And when we found it on our side, I let them know we will be, when we do biological control for emerald ash borer, because that's definitely one of the things that we will be doing. Um, because there are, I didn't go into all of that, but there is biological control for, for EAD as well. Um, we will probably be coordinating so that what we do on our side is equivalent to what they do on their side, because not only is the Emerald Ash Borer gonna fly across the border, because the river's pretty narrow up there, um, but also the, the parasites will be flying back and forth. So we do, we do interact a lot with them. And at a provincial and a state level, we have, we have freedom to, to do that. Um, and that's, yeah, that's really, really important. <laughs> yeah. Mine's quick. Mine's quick. Mine's quick. <laughs> what do you report, uh, like, a sighting of, like, a, the Emerald Ash Borer? Is, is there, like... Um, there, I've got in the back, there's a little brochure that shows you um, the various signs and symptoms. Um, 
One of the things to look for is if you see bark splits. Um, and, and underneath the bark split, you might see kind of an S-shaped gallery. Uh, I think on the, 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 the display that I handed around, there was a little piece of bark that had, had sort of the, the tunnels underneath the bark, kind of showing you what that looked like. Um, so those are some of the things you can look for. Uh, definitely, woodpecker feeding is, is something, something to look for. Uh, there are kind of a D-shaped exit hole. And there's, again, cards back there that, that I, you know, well, you're welcome to take. Um, and they have very distinctive exit holes when they come out from under the bark. Those are really small, though, and it sometimes it's hard to see unless the tree has actually been cut down and you can look at it closely. So there are definitely a few signs to see. And, and just the, the trees declining. So if you see a lot of ash trees that are dying, especially from the top down, and it's spreading from one tree to the next, and, and trees are dying within a few years, that's something to definitely give us a call for. And we'll come check it out. Um, and I was just wondering if the, uh, like, you were talking about how the, the brown town moths populations were controlled so like a few years ago. Yeah. Like, is that still an active program or did they just like cut it off because they cut, like, Yeah, they cut that off. There was federal funding for this a long time ago and I think in the 60s or so. They had it, basically they had chased it out to just a few islands offshore. Um, the Casco Bay area, and then the feds cut the funding for that, saying, yeah, it's not that big a deal. Um, and so, so there was no funding to do anything, and the quarantine was lifted, and it did eventually come back. And I think now probably people are kicking themselves for it, because now we've got this huge, huge problem. It's still fairly localized. No other state really cares about it the way Maine does. Um, because it's not really anywhere else, else in the country except, you know, potentially in, in, or it is in Massachusetts. It has the potential to move to other New England states. It hasn't yet. Um, but I think we're kind of finally convincing the entomologists in some of our neighboring states. And, and certainly Nova Scotia and New Brunswick are taking it seriously as well. And they're looking for it because they know it could spread to those, those states again. And is it getting just as like, like, I know it's, it's like growing a lot in Maine. Is it doing the same in Massachusetts? I'm not entirely sure. I think it's not as bad yet. It's not growing there as fast. It seems to be kind of an epicenter sort of for us around the, the Bath Brunswick area and has been moving south and north or east and west along the coast as well as moving inland hugely. So um, I'm not sure, certainly, I think Massachusetts is a little bit on the rise. I don't think it's nearly as bad as we are at this point. Not as widespread. <laughs>